Hello and welcome to the Alliance for Democracies, the Populist Dialogues. Our program promotes progressive populist perspectives on the issues of the day. The Alliance for Democracies is de dedicated to establishing true democracy and creating a just society based on an equitable, sustainable economy. Our guest today is Russell Lum, a trade justice coordinator with Oregon Fair Trade Campaign. We're going to talk primarily about the renegotiation of NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement, uh, which is a 23-year-old agreement between the United States, Canada, and Mexico. So welcome to our program. Thank you, David. Great. Glad yeah. to be here. Good. I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're doing the work you're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, tell us, first of all, because 23 years is a long time and people forget, tell us a little bit about um, the beginning of NAFTA, uh, the history, just so people know what it was or why it, why it is, those kind of questions. Sure, sure. Well, prior to NAFTA, there was the U.S.-Canada Free Trade Agreement, uh, which the ruling class of both countries very much liked. And uh, this was the era of, and which we're still in, the era of globalization. Mm -hmm. And so they thought themselves very smart in thinking to exp expand the free trade area to include Mexico. Um, and this was the early 90s. You know, NAFTA was negotiated in 1991 um, and passed by the various legislatures in 93 and went into effect in 94. Uh, interestingly, they were onto something kind of new in the respect that for a major free trade agreement, NAFTA was one of the first between what we would call like wealthy industrialized economies and a lesser industrialized or a lesser developed economy. Um, so the, the pushers of, of the economic trend of, of neoliberal capitalism uh, looked at NAFTA as a way to be cutting edge in their free trade agreements uh, by entering one with an economy that they thought they would industrialize, that they thought they would bring into the modern era. Um, of course, in doing so, they perfectly intended to radically transform Mexico's economy, um, which large sections of were agrarian and large sections of were subsistence. Uh, and like I say, they thought it a good idea to turn Mexico uh, into a chiefly export economy for goods. Uh -huh. um, and, uh, and there's a certain imbalance there when you talk about creating a, a free trade zone between very wealthy industrialized societies and a lesser industrialized mm -hmm. country. Um, they saw that opening up that border between the U.S. And, and, and Canada's border, in a sense, with Mexico, they saw that opening up that border uh, would have all kinds of possibilities for the things that we see um, capitalists doing and then and still doing, uh, resource extraction uh, in communities where the big money has more power, uh, and looking for, for cheap labor. Right. Um, eyeing Mexico as a way uh, to find the labor for goods production uh -huh, right. that would uh, that would fuel or continue to fuel or, or step up um, globalization. Right. So it would it would in their in their view it would be uh, manufacturing would be able to leave the United States and Canada, be manufactured in Mexico, and then re-exported or not re-exported but exported back to, into the United States yeah. and into Canada. Yeah. That was certainly one of the known intended effects, and there are so many contradictions when you look at the history of when NAFTA began about what the intention really was, mm -hmm. because people who were pushing NAFTA, um, including people in the Clinton administration, Al Gore and Bill Clinton, they said it would create jobs in the United States. They also said it would create jobs in Mexico. Uh, and they and they they, they tried to have it both ways. Uh, yes, uh, they had it neither way. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, and it's not just what you say about uh, relieving United States companies of making products in the high cost labor conditions of the United States, but it was also supposedly in, in that era's economic mindset about relieving the poor country from the need to produce its own food. Mm -hmm. um, it's very actually very interesting. Um, about six or seven years ago, Bill Clinton, in a moment of admission over reflecting on the economic policy of that time. Mm -hmm. He said roughly, and I, I care about the quote so much I can almost say it verbatim, but he said, Bill Clinton said in like 2010 or something, that since 1973 the United States has followed an economic policy that we rich countries should relieve the burden of producing the food of poor countries mm -hmm. from themselves. So we create a massive amount of food, we create grain staples for poor countries' economies, and it'll help them jumpstart into the industrial era. Mm -hmm. and Bill Clinton's co quote goes on to say, we did that and it did not work. Yeah. And I was party to it. 
Uh, yes, he was a big party to it. <laughs> yes, he was a huge party to it. Yeah, I remember all those arguments at, at mm -hmm. the time, uh, and particularly uh, because the agreement was negotiated by uh, his predecessor, George Bush, uh, who couldn't get it through Congress. And so um, um, Bill Clinton then pushed it through Congress, and it was really a very contentious issue. In fact, uh, I don't know if you know this, but there was a, another guy named Ross Perot sure. uh, who ran as an, indep I think, independent party. Anyways, he, he was not a Republican or a Democrat, and uh, he had a very strong um, uh, showing mm -hmm. in that election. In fact, it said that Bill Clinton probably would not have won the election had Ross Perot not been a, a candidate because he drew uh, votes from the Republican Republican Party. Uh, so mm -hmm. why was I going there? Um, well, it was so contentious. It was, uh, yes, it was. It was very contentious, and the and the issue was about what to do with NAFTA. And Ross Perot did his famous quote about hearing, uh, hearing the, the, giant the, the suck, sucking the giant sound. sucking sound from from Mexico uh -huh. uh, that would result from uh, from the, from the passage. Uh, so, uh, mm -hmm. so talk a little bit about what did happen. Sure. Well, um, just thinking about the way those conversations went in the early 90s and what's going on now, you can kind of see, I think, that from the Perot era, if you will, mm -hmm. to the Trump era, you can see how Clintonite democratic policy for free trade eclipsed. Um, you know, uh, the Clinton presidency uh, and a failed attempt to become president by Hillary Clinton uh, kind of show you the free trade era of, of democratic U.S. policy. And how uh, it didn't it didn't win uh, the public confidence. Yeah. Uh, and what we what we saw out of the 23 years of NAFTA uh, was the false promise that it would create U.S. jobs. Um, when you look at the Department of Labor's statistics, which they get from their Trade Adjustment Program, which is kind of the government arm, which certifies that yes, indeed, your job was lost directly due to our own trade policy. Mm -hmm. And so here's a consolation prize, if you like. Uh, yeah. uh, that's the Trade Adjustment Assistance Program. Mm -hmm. uh, so the Department of Labor keeps those numbers, and it says more than 910,000 jobs in the United States in the NAFTA era were directly a result of trade. Yeah. That's how many people got uh, Trade Act benefits. Right, yeah. Um, and, and, and one of the key words there is directly because they don't count a lot of the subsidiary jobs that, uh, you know, that also get lost because people don't have money to spend anymore because they don't have the jobs. Absolutely. Yeah, right. I mean, all of the, all of the indirect effects of, of an economy that doesn't have a tax base which doesn't have a vibrant private, uh, public sector, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, but furthermore, it doesn't even count the people who never applied for Trade Act assistance, oh, that's true. Um, mm -hmm. but also had jobs um, just as equally blamable to trade policy. Right. Okay. Um, so, you know, the notion that it would create U.S. jobs, um, I think uh, we can see that the, the outrage and the hurt over, uh, over the U.S. economy and over the decline of the middle class it tells the other story. Mm -hmm. uh, it tells the story of, of job loss. Um, and you know, it also said that, uh, that it would cause Mexican, the Mexican middle class to grow mm -hmm. um, because now we, there would be people working in, in a goods export economy in Mexico with slowly rising wages. And that didn't happen. No. Uh, the actual real average wage for a Mexican worker is lower than it was in 1994 when NAFTA began. Really? Oh, um, I did not know that. Yeah, and, oh. and that is astounding when you consider, um, you know, how many people were entered into, from a more agrarian economy into this, the global, the globalized market economy, mm -hmm. um, where wealth is supposed to be generated. Yeah. Well, wealth is generated, but whom did it go to? Mm -hmm. It did not go to the Mexican workers who were the engine of that export growth. Right. Um, it went to the corporations, um, chiefly the ones that are U.S. or Canada-based, that decided to open up shop in Mexico. Right. Yeah. Um, so, so when when NAFTA went into effect, what was the what what happened? What happened was. Countries. Well, what happened was companies that operate in Canada or the U.S. Uh, became very free and and really incentivized by NAFTA's rules uh, to move their production to Mexico, um, and it created you know um, the maquiladora economy, the maquiladora phenomenon, where towns strung along uh, the you know the, the Mexico's northern border. Uh, became these free trade protected zones mm -hmm. um, where U.S. companies of all manner created uh, production and assembly plants 
um, that pay sweatshop wages and because of Mexico's lack of, of actual uh, you know, labor rights and because of Mexico's lack of actual robust unions, um, that's, uh, that's an economy that we can look to, the maquiladora phenomenon that we can look to and say that's, that's not the model that we want to base neither Mexico's economy nor the global economy on. Uh -huh. um, so I, I mean I think one of the most important impacts of NAFTA to point to is how many people work in anti-worker conditions, in highly carbon intensive and highly chemical intensive conditions in the factories of, of the cities of Mexico. Um, that uh, you know, it, it funneled people uh, from Mexico to in migrate uh, to those factories uh, from the sectors that were the losers of NAFTA, right. like Mexico's small farms, mm -hmm. um, which is the simple reality that you know about three million people who were in the Mexico uh, smaller mid-sized farm economy, uh, smaller mid-sized farm workers or smaller mid-sized farm owners of Mexico um, were displaced. They went to uh, the jobs in the maquilas. Um, and not because it would give them higher wages, uh, like I say, real average wages declined, uh -huh. uh, but because they have to survive some way. Right. Um, and not to mention that, they also went over the border uh, in the form of a spike of immigration to the U.S. Uh, yes, um, I was going to ask you sure, about that. Sure, so, sure. Yeah. Oh, right, yeah. Yeah. Well, we're just trying to go around and hit all of the costs of NAFTA right yeah. now, uh -huh. but certainly that um, upending people's livelihoods, upending generations of small farming um, for communities in Mexico uh, caused um, the destabilization uh, of, of people and place, which after all an economy should protect people and place. Uh, but this economy does not. Uh, this economy looks at uh, whose profit margins can increase. Right. And that's why trade agreements are uh, they're debated sectorally, you know. They, when they meet to renegotiate a trade agreement, it's like, okay, how can we benefit the textile industry? How can we benefit the services industry? How can we benefit the this and the that? Mm -hmm. um, so that's whom they're looking out for instead of people in place. Oh, right. uh, and the people in place are, are, are hung out to dry under the NAFTA model uh, by becoming people who live in the shadows in the United States because you cross the desert to try a better life in the U.S or to try a better life in, in the, the shanties of, of places like El Paso and Tijuana, mm -hmm. um, where you can try to earn a dollar a day, or pardon me, a dollar an hour, um, you know, as a, as a worker, again, for, mm -hmm. for uh, an economy written in mind, uh, not, not for you. Yeah, yeah, right, yeah. Yeah, so, uh, you know, thinking back, when I was a kid, uh, when we didn't have these agreements, although actually the, the process was set in place by uh, Richard Nixon to negotiate these agreements. Uh, but at any rate, uh, when I was a kid I, and growing up into my 20s and 30s, the South was Mexico, in that the, the South was the, the low wage area uh, of the nation. And so there was a, a lot of companies in the northern part that would start, that started moving their factories to the south. Sure. You know, it was like, okay, they did as much damage there as they possibly could. Uh, let's go international, let's go to Mexico. And NAFTA was born. That's my kind of quick, <laughs> quick, right. quick timeline. Right. But the south is still being left behind, particularly as the great majority of the right to work states. Yes. Um, the, the percentages of the workforce in the southern states that are unionized are stunning. Um, for it's instance, in South Carolina, yes, in South right. Carolina, three percent of of workers are in a union. Wow. Um, in Oregon, it's like sixteen percent, uh -huh. yeah. um, which is rather high. I mean, not not compared to where it should be, but uh, yeah, uh, right. but compared to the national um, totals. Uh, yeah. Um, right. 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 Uh, so no, the South is still being left behind, and, and auto auto companies still utilize the South as a as a as an anti worker right. lower lower wage base. Right. Um, but. Uh, but yeah, yeah. Uh, well, and, and you can say that they went south um, in the Nixon, after the Nixon era, but of course farther south yet, CAFTA, Colombia, and mm -hmm. so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it didn't, it didn't end there. And, and I think it follows the principle of, of perpetual growth capitalists um, to find you know, the new places where they can squeeze out profit. Right. Um, oh. and, that, and, and they do that locally in city politics, you know, where, where can we develop to squeeze out profit? They do it nationally in this country. Where can we where can we put our factory like Louisiana to, 
to uh, to you know squeeze out profit yeah. and on and and on. Yeah. And so okay. the, this is the global rule that the that the economy runs by. How do you exploit? How do you extract? Right. How how, how do you go to the lowest standards? Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. So um, we're we're almost. Uh, in fact, we are halfway through the program already. So let's talk about what's going on now. Sure. What's going on now is. Uh, President Trump realized that he had some currency as a candidate if he stoked outrage over the loss of the middle class, uh, which is well documented. Mm -hmm. uh, and he talked about the loss of U.S. manufacturing. He has a problem with the loss of U.S. manufacturing. And to the tune of expressing a lot of outrage as a candidate at the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, and at NAFTA, calling NAFTA the worst trade deal in history. He called it other things, too, yeah. like one of the worst deals in U.S. history, one of the worst deals in world history, but the hyperbole goes on and on. So, um, it suggests yes. that he didn't like it much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and, uh, and won a lot of votes from people whose interests he doesn't have at heart. Mm -hmm. uh, he won a lot of working class votes um, on the strength of advocating against NAFTA. And now, from my perception, he backed himself into a corner to actually renegotiate it. I think when you look at Trump, you see kind of a wounded ego that's very nervous to look like he lived up to campaign promises. Mm -hmm. uh, he, I think he wants to um, look the success, uh, more than anything in the world really, look, look the success and, and look the, the prominent man he perceived himself to be. And in so doing, he has to protect his legacy and he has to do one of the things that he said he would do, which was change NAFTA. Mm -hmm. And so he renegotiated it, or he has begun renegotiating it with Mexico and Canada. Mm -hmm. And that's a process that will go on and on until, they're, until they have a new text that they like, which then they'll send to their respective legislatures. Yeah. Uh, and so about every three weeks, the US, Mexico, and Canada come together for four days at a time, and they sit down and, and talk about what the new NAFTA should look like. Okay. Um, that's what's what, that's what's going on. But the you know the ruling class in these countries uh, are very happy with the NAFTA model, and maybe they're even more happy to see it opened up to businesses that didn't get the economic windfall that NAFTA was in '94, like the data trade, um, big internet. Those companies didn't get a windfall in '94. The economy was in a different place, mm -hmm. and maybe the NAFTA renegotiation is a way um, for those capitalists to start winning under the NAFTA model. Oh uh, yeah, right. Um, yeah. So that's kind of what we're talking about with the NAFTA renegotiation, which is completely inadequate, and uh, the Trump administration. Uh, is is interested in in looking like they improved it and in looking like they got a win. You know, trade is one of the only areas polled where people actually think Trump's doing any good. Mm -hmm. Of course, he's not doing any good, um, but it's very dangerous uh, for progressives to to feed the idea that uh, that that Trump is 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 winning or doing right by the country on on the trade issue. Yeah, but, the, yeah. that, but that's why the NAFTA renegotiation exists as I think a political point for himself. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And. and it is interesting that for a long, long time, you know, people talked about uh, you know the ill effects of NAFTA and wondering what could be done about it, uh, and nobody talked about actually renegotiating. In fact, there was uh, you know in discussions that I had been party to, it was like there was no way of renegotiating. There was no way of getting out of it, and so uh, Trump has you know demonstrated. That in fact, there is a process that can be used to do that. But what you and I would want to have a re uh, as a result of renegotiating NAFTA is probably not the same as what Trump w is trying to do. So talk yeah. about, talk yeah, about yeah. what we want. Yeah, well, labor, human rights defenders, migrants' rights defenders, environmentalists, back when NAFTA was being negotiated, knew what it would cost, and they said, no, you cannot enter a trade agreement like this unless you create a trinational set of standards on labor rights and you create a trinational set of standards on, on protecting the environment. Um, and that we got lost in the NAFTA process. And for 23 years, um, labor and defenders of the environment have been talking about things like, hey, bring this agreement up again um, mm -hmm. and, and expose it for, um, for, the, for the wrongs that it's done people and, and done the planet. Um, and so we are now in a position because the renegotiation began to actually have a window into getting what we want out of out of out of this NAFTA 2.0 and uh, what we want is to say look the three countries have incredible buy-in on NAFTA when Trump said to renegotiate it Mexico and Canada were there because these three economies are so intertwined they couldn't not be there mm -hmm. there's great buy-in and there's great enforcement um, when these panels that NAFTA entitles to, to bring into being and to make rulings that are binding on all three countries when these panels occur uh, those rulings get adhered to. Uh, NAFTA has great enforcement. And so what we talk about is changing NAFTA from an agreement for 
for profit centers, for profit margins, to being an agreement for people and planet with the same kind of enforcement because it's actually quite, it's quite robust. Uh, yeah. What if NAFTA became a tri-national agreement for a certain standard for wages that you can't go beneath in the three countries? What if it became a certain standard for which toxics you can't use in, in your chemically intensive uh, manufacturing? What if it became a standard for emissions and for climate? Of course, the Trump administration is completely un, uninterested in that, right? Mm -hmm. um, but a new NAFTA, from the perspective you and I carry, uh, would be a tri-national zone of human rights. Uh -huh. uh, and, and, and like we're saying, the people who have been hurt by the NAFTA model, we were so loud that an actually na anti-NAFTA president got elected, first of all, mm -hmm. but also now that we have a window, um, we can talk about what we need out of this new NAFTA and how it's different from the nationalism uh, that Trump uses when he lays into NAFTA. Mm -hmm. Okay, oh, okay. Uh, so how do we know what's actually going on? How do we know what's actually being negotiated? Well, I wish it were a different answer, but really we know when, at the end of the negotiating round, some spokesperson for the three countries says, oh, we made great progress, we talked about services, there's some agreement on in the environment, there's some agreement on data, and that's all we get. Mm -hmm. uh, that plus whatever the governments choose to kind of tell the press, um, leak to the press. Uh -huh. um, because the, the negotiator for the United States is the, the USTR, the US Trade Representative, Robert Lighthizer, and he said that the actual content of what gets decided inside those negotiating rounds is classified. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. So they're negotiating it in our name, and if you believe Trump, with intent to better this country's end of the deal. Mm -hmm. uh, but we don't know what's being said. Well, we don't know yeah. what's being yeah. said. And, right. and, if, and if you ask um, some of the transparency champions of trade policy in Congress, like Senator Ron Wyden of ours here in Oregon, mm -hmm. he'll say, oh, well, we solve transparency. Let me tell you how. Uh, once the three countries have agreed on a text, they'll send it to Congress, and at least three months it has to be public, and, and we can read it. For three months, we can read it. Yeah. Oh, boy. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> but Congress can't amend it because yeah. of the fast track rules, right. which, which mandate an up or down vote on, on trade agreements. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, so we demand you... that Ron Wyden say, you know what, that's actually not good enough. Reading it for three months is not the same as being a voice that can provide input into it as it's going on. Right. Because counter to transparency, like I said, Lighthizer said that the content of the negotiations as they happen is completely classified. Right. And then the, the, the other part of the decrease in transparency is that uh, in past negotiations like the TPP and all these other agreements that we've, we've been party to, uh, they have had um, events that, um, I, I want to call them vendor events that for, for a civil society where they could set up their booths and tables and have representatives. So they wouldn't be part of the negotiation, but they would be on site while the negotiations were happening. Uh, and all of those events with regard to this renegotiation of NAFTA uh, are not happening. So even less chance of them actually hearing the voices of us mm -hmm. uh, than has happened in the mm -hmm. past. So um, two, two, uh, two major differences. Uh, and as I recall, and I might be wrong, uh, Trump had actually called for transparency in this negotiations. Hmm. Uh, but that, that's definitely not happening. Yeah, right. yeah. Well, I think his, his trade representative, representative said, we will have a transparent process. But once it began in August, when he was questioned about transparency, he said, well, look at how we had a public comment period, you know? Oh, that was remember, it. Remember when we had a public comment period? Right, yeah. And remember when I extended the deadline by a week? That's uh, your transparency. Okay. You know, that's, your, yeah. that's your round of input. That's, that's your vending to us about what you want in this trade agreement. Right, that's uh, totally, uh, I will say, that was totally inadequate. <laughs> right. <laughs> to say the right, least, right, right, yeah. Yeah, so uh, specifically, can, can you be, uh, we've got three minutes, actually two minutes, Talk about what some of the other organizations that are uh, commenting on this renegotiation, what are they saying? Well, we're seeing a lot of international solidarity from unions. Um, Unifor is Canada's largest private sector union. And uh, the president of Unifor spent his Labor Day, you know, Canada celebrates Labor Day, it originated Labor Day, so it celebrates it the same day the U.S. does. Oh. And uh, Jerry Diaz, the president of large, Canada's largest private sector union, spent his Labor Day in the streets with an independent Mexican union protesting NAFTA. Oh. 
Um, and so one of the things that we're seeing is uh, big labor going to bat for one another and for um, united principles on what a NAFTA should look like. Mm -hmm. And that's very exciting. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and the other organizations working on it, you know, are the coalition that really have been against this, uh, this trade uh, agenda all along. Um, environmentalists and unions and human rights groups, pro-democracy groups like, like Alliance for Democracy. Uh -huh. um, we are finding our voice because trade is intersectional and the corporations are international. So if our, if our solidarity is not international, uh, if our strength and our and our power growing is not international, uh, we're we're fighting the wrong uh, fighting the wrong yeah. battle, and we're going to lose. Oh, right, yeah, and, and that's really important because what we really want to do is end up with an, an agreement that is beneficial to workers and citizens living in Canada, living in the United States, and living in Mexico. It has to be about lifting up everyone. It has to be about lifting up everyone, yeah. right? So that's uh, that, that's that's very good. So let's well the the, the banner this this banner here is a banner that we are holding on the corner of, uh, of East Burnside Bridge and um, MLK, or uh, Grand, one or the other, uh, a couple of times a week just to raise awareness of what's happening. And it just in summary form tells us exactly what we need to do. We need to protect jobs, we need to protect the environment, and we need to protect democracy. And specifically, we need to end the corporate power grab. And we didn't really get to talk about ISDS, the investor state uh, mm -hmm. dispute settlement process. Um, 30 seconds. Well, so that's the provision of NAFTA. And NAFTA really brought it to the fore in a very big way globally and in a manner copied by future trade agreements. That's the process where corporations can sue governments. And it's not reciprocal. The governments can't sue the corporations. But corporations can sue governments over what they claim are lost profits, mm -hmm. the loss of expected future profits, because you're your darn government passed some law, that's some public interest law that got in the way of here, oh, here was our plan to exploit something that, uh, and, and hundreds of millions of dollars are doled out to corporations from taxpayer treasuries mm -hmm. to corporations because they win these suits that are entitled by NAFTA that great. operate in secret. Good, good. Thank you very much for being here. Okay. I'm glad to have been here. Thank All you, right. David. Great, yeah. good. Thank you. We've been talking with Russell Lem, a trade justice coordinator with the Oregon Fair Trade Campaign. If you support and renegotiate an after that promotes the interests of working people in all three of the agreement's partner nations, the U.S., Canada, and Mexico, then please contact your U.S. representative and your U.S. senators to tell them uh, to demand that the negoti negotiations be conducted with a, the greatest degree of transparency possible so we all know what's being done in our name and supposedly for our benefit. That is the first step to having an agreement which supports we, the people. Additionally, ask that they not support any agreement which has the investor state dispute settlement clause in it. For more information, please visit the Alliance for Democracy Portland website pages on NAFTA. Use this link, www.tinyurl.com slash replace NAFTA for news and petitions. Also, take a look at this website replace nafta.org. Thank you for watching. I hope we'll see you all again next week. Bye.